his glory all around when he saved my soul. I remember the day when the Lord saved me. All of heaven came down. All of heaven came down. I was happy and free. Glory filled my soul. singing didn't you I enjoyed that that was good if I did I turn this on is it all right good okay good all right well praise the Lord I like that old-fashioned singing didn't you? Yeah, I like that I like that I sure did I've enjoyed and I always enjoy the singing at this church you just you just don't get no better and I really do appreciate the good music. And uh, you know, when you got it in the right spot, you don't monkey with it. Amen. You, you, you don't try to, you don't tinker with something that's, that's, that's running good, you know. Just leave it where it's at. Don't, don't, don't mess. Don't just keep doing what you're doing. And so that's good. And I appreciate, again, everything, all the, the goodies that people have given us and... Uh, and the nice room, the stuff that were in the room, the meals, and my goodness. And I appreciate your church. Now, thank you for everything. And thank you for being here. Brother Bell, thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed so much hearing Brother Johnson, hearing him preach. I've enjoyed it. And one minute he'll have you laughing, and one minute he'll have you crying, won't he? And uh, sometimes he'll have you laughing till you're crying. 
but uh, I've enjoyed him. I've enjoyed his messages. I, I get something out of it. Yeah. It, it, it does, he does something for me. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you for this uh, in, invitation to be your pastor. Look in your Bible in 1 Samuel 25. And I'm going to try to preach and get out of the way here and let Brother Johnson preach to you. In 1 Samuel 25, here's a story where David is fleeing from Saul. And he's got his men with him. They're in the wilderness fleeing. And they're, he had a, a number of men with him. So they need food. And so uh, the prophet Samuel died. And, and that was a heartache to David. And they're in the wilderness of Paran. And they came upon some sheep shearers that belonged to a man by the name of Nabal. Now don't get him confused with Naboth, but Nabal. And this man was a wealthy man. He was very wealthy. And God had blessed him. He didn't have enough sense to know it, but God had. And you know there's people that way. That if you say, boy, God's been good to you, and they'll say, well, I've worked hard. Well, that's true, but let me tell you something. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So I got news for you. You can't even set your foot on the floor unless God gives you the strength to do it. And Naboth did not realize that. And he was an ungrateful, unaware man of a whole lot of things. And you're going to see that. Now, but I will give him this. He was an unconverted man that did not have much light. And so you and I tonight that are in this room don't have that excuse. So we can't, we can't say, well, I didn't know. Because we do know. And we're aware of some things that Nabal was not. Now he could have learned quick and did learn. But he learned too late. Now in this chapter... In verse 2, 1 Samuel 25, 2 said, There was a man of man whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man, look, was very great and had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, and he was shearing sheep in Carmel. Now, when it said he was very great, it didn't mean he was a great man. He was very wealthy. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about his possessions. Now, the name of the man was Nabal. And the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding. And of a beautiful countenance. But the man was curlish. That meant hateful. Unkind. Evil man. It says curlish and evil. In his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And, and David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men. Get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say unto him that liveth in prosperity. Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all thy house. Now what that means was he said, peace, we're coming peacefully. We're not coming for trouble. So greet him, nice, tell him we're coming peacefully. And, and now, verse 7, I have heard that thou hast shears, and now thy shepherds which were with us, we heard them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee, wherefore let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays that break away from every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and water and my flesh that I've killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told David uh, and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird you on every man his sword. Now, he asked nice the first time. But they're hungry and they're tired and there's no Walmart. There, they ain't no, there's nowhere to go. 
this is it. This is where they can get what they need. So when David, when they came back and said, we told him, sir, everything you said, and he said, no, who are you? Who you think you are? David said, boys, buckle up your belts. Put your swords on. We're going to take what we need. That's basically what's going on here. So they girded on every man his sword, and David girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, and 200 abode by the stuff. Now, they had some things with them, but there was 400. David just took 200 with him. Some abode by the stuff. They stayed back. And I like that, because in another place, the same thing happened in the 30th chapter of 1 Samuel. Some men abode by the stuff. And by the way, that's as important as the men that are going. Now, you, you may not can sing like they just did. You may not can play that piano, that organ. You may not can preach. You may not can do some things. But everybody in this room can just stay by the stuff. So you can do that. And 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent out messengers to the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. Verse 15, But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou shalt do, for evil determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a man of Belial that a man cannot speak unto him. In other words, he's so devilish, nobody can talk to him. You know, you're in trouble when nobody can't tell you anything. And, and he was, and, and that's, now this is one of the servants telling his wife this. And Abigail made haste. Abigail was not only pretty, Brother Johnson, she had some sense. And she made haste and took 200 loaves, 200 bottles of wine, five sheep dressed, five measures of parched corn, 100 clusters of raisin, 200 fig, cake of figs, and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so that as she rode on the ass, she came down by the cover of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited it me evil for good. So more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave one of the that pertaineth to him by the morning life, or any that pisseth against the wall. So David said this, I'm coming... And I'm going to take everybody. I'm taking what he's got. Now he wants to do war, we'll do war. Abigail knew that if she could run out ahead and meet David with this food, maybe she could talk to him. And she was right. She was right. And, and Abigail, uh, the Bible said, and she haste, verse 23, hasted and laid off the ass and fell down before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet uh, and said upon me my Lord and upon me let this iniquity be and let thine handmaid I pray thee speak in the audience and hear the words of thine handmaid now I'm going to stop right here because I, I really would like to read the whole chapter I preached with brother Howells one time and I read about as much scripture as I've read right here brother Johnson and I was so nervous my knees was beating one again the other and when I prayed and I got done, I preached that night after the service. Oh, no, when he got up to preach, when he got up to preach, he said, Brother Cox, the next time you're going to have your devotions, do it before you preach. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I read a lot of scripture, I think about Brother Al. <laughs> so let me pray, and then I'm going to bring you a message tonight on this. Don't lose what you have. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you'll help me to help the people of God. I thank you for this dear pastor, his people, these other pastors that have come tonight and brought their people, my friends, and brought people from their churches that are here tonight. Lord, bless them and bless 
Anchor Baptist Church. Bless Brother Johnson as he comes in a little bit to preach to us and use him as you have this week to help us. In Christ's name, amen. Here's a man that uh, did not realize what was getting ready to happen. All he would have had to, he would have never missed. He could have brought and spread tables and fed every one of David's men and been okay. He'd have been all right. He'd never missed it. He, he had plenty. It wasn't that. It wasn't that, that like he was saying, well, what are we going to do for food? That, that was not the problem. He had, you can see here, he was, a, he was a man that prospered. And by the way, if you want to keep prospering, you ought to get to where you learn how to give. I believe, you, I believe this church is learned. I believe you're learning and learned. And the quicker you learn it, the better you, you, you off you are. See, and uh, but but uh, Nabal never did learn it, and I want to tell you something. He lost. Nabal was careless. He lost his sheep. They come and got him anyhow. He lost his spouse. David uh, didn't just wind up with sheep. He wound up with his wife and the farm and the whole outfit. Amen. <laughs> David had everything. He didn't. Just, hey, he, because of being so hateful and selfish and ungodly. He lost the sheep, spouse. And, and by the way, his, his spirit, he done lost that. And then in the end of it, he lost his soul. There's not anything to, to show us that Nabal was a saved man. Matter of fact, just the opposite. He died drunk. So he, was, he lost all the way around. Really, you could look and just say, man, what a foolish man. Right. When all he had to do was turn loose of some of this and let him go on and, and him still prosper. He would have still prospered. God would have blessed him for it. Now, you know, and I think about, though, the sad part is that people don't think about what you stand to lose sometimes. Come on. Right. Yes, sir. And I, I, I want to say this right here. Number one, I'm preaching to you, you know, don't lose what you have. Number one, uh, uh, never be ungrateful for what you already have. Amen. And realize where things come from. Yes, sir. Right. You know, the Bible said in James that every good gift and every perfect gift Amen. comes from God. Amen. Now, we got tens of thousands. Brother Johnson preached this morning on uh, count your blessings. And Brother Johnson, if we'd have started this morning when you preached and, and didn't even go to lunch or didn't even take a break, we would still be counting the blessings. They're, 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 but we still ought to count. Because when you count them, it keeps you thinking about how good God's been to you. So you got thousands of good blessings, but you got a few perfect gifts. Your salvation's perfect. God made it. It's God's and He gave it to you. It's perfect gift. You have a perfect Bible that He gave you. You have a perfect Holy Spirit. And one day we'll have a perfect home. It'll be a gift. So there's some perfect things you got. But there's thousands of good things you got. Hey, think about your salvation. And I'm repeating some of what he said. But every day you live, how could you forget that you're, that, that you're, that you're saved? Now, you say, can people do it? Peter says you can. There's people I think that never even think about being saved. That are saved. They've went back on God. But do you thank God every day for what he did for you to save you? And then you ought to thank God every day for your sweet family. There's not a day goes by that I don't thank God. Listen, for my family. And I name them. I don't just say thank you, Lord, for my family. I'm talking about I call their names. And, I, and I, as I did this morning, and say, God, take care of them. And by name, my sweet family. Because I realize that every one of them is only one heartbeat away from being taken. It can happen so fast. And you say, well, I thought they'd be here. 
I try to call my mother and dad every day because they're still alive. And I know that it won't be long till I get a phone call that they're not here. So I want to thank God for every day that they're alive. So never be ungrateful for your salvation, for your sweet family, for the Spirit of God that lives in you to guide you. Never be ungrateful then for the Scriptures, your Bible. I thank God I have a Bible. Hey, and I'm talking about one that absolutely, without any shadow of a doubt, this old King James, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, is absolutely perfect. It's perfect. It don't need no updating. It don't need... It don't need no nothing but read and loved and memorized. I thank God every day for the Bible. And so I thank Him. I mean, every day I said, Lord, thank You for Your Word You gave me. So uh, never be ungrateful for these things. Never be ungrateful for substance, things that you've got that God has given you. For the automobiles and gasoline that's in them and the house you live in. You know, there we ought to be thankful in more months than just November Amen. over the week of Thanksgiving. This ought to be an everyday thing. So you'll, you'll always be mindful of things if you're constantly thanking God. And the Bible said that we're to give thanks for all things. Now I'll tell you something. If you do that, you're going to spend, where it says pray without ceasing, you, you'll spend a lot more time praying when you start itemizing and looking over what God's done. I never, Brother Bell, and I'm not trying to tell you how spiritual I am because I need a whole lot of improvement. But there's not a day that I don't thank God for the house I live in, the cars I drive, our church facilities for every building. I go through every building and thank God because I can remember when we didn't have nothing. I'll go in our auditorium sometimes, just sit down and look and say, God, I sure thank you for such a nice place to go. I thank you for the paved parking. I remember when we had mud on the parking lot and, and, and ladies would tear their shoes all to pieces and track mud all through the place. People tracking mud and gravel and dirt. Now the parking lot's got pavement on it. And we need to repave ours. It's broke up. But I'd still rather have cracked pavement than no pavement. I thank God for everything we got. I was in Honduras. You've heard me tell this story. I was in Honduras preaching a few years ago. It's been several years ago now. Brother Manning, I was down there and a guy was going to take me back to the airport. And uh, the pastor, I had to run and catch a plane. And a man said, uh, the pastor said, Brother Cox, this man right here and his son's taking you back to the airport. And there stood a man uh, that uh, had his little boy with him. Little old boy was barefooted, had on a pair of cut off shorts. And was standing there barefooted and he was smiling. And the dad was standing there smiling. And they said, uh, w- w- come on preacher, you're going with us. And I, I got in a little Ford Focus. And it was one of the first ones. It looked like the first one they'd ever made. <laughs> Brother Bell, in my life, I've never rid, ridden a car that was so worn out. The tires was as slick as the top of this pulpit. There wasn't no tread on them. The paint was peeling and faded. The windshield had been hit by so many gravels and rocks from the roads down there that it would just look like lines back and forth across it. I got in at the dash where the heat down there had, had gotten to the dash. It had crinkled it up to where it looked like foam coming up, you know, where it, the, the busting up through the, the dash. The seat that I sat in was literally, you had to watch where the wires would get a hold of your <laughs> pants. And I got in that car and sat down and buckled up and that little boy in the back seat just stuck his head right up between me and his daddy and was just smiling at me. And we started down the road and, and I said, well, brother, how long have you been in the church? And he told me and we got to talk a little bit. And he said, pastor, he said, I took the week off. This week I took off from work to come to this meeting. 
I said, wonderful. And I said, that's good. He said, yeah. He said, it's worth it. And I said, brother, if you don't mind me asking, how much do you make down where you work? I mean, what are they, about your wages? He said, pastor, and he was as happy as he could be. He said, I make $20 a week. And he said, glory to God. And then he said, Pastor, he said, look what God has given me. And he started talking about that. Brother Johnson, he said, look at my car. He said, God gave me this. And he started crying for joy. I started crying. But it wasn't over joy. It was for conviction. Because the church had just given me a car about three weeks before I got down there. I wouldn't for no amount of money told him about that car. I wouldn't have told him nothing about it. I wouldn't have showed him a picture of it. Because I was ashamed that I was not as happy as he was. And if I parked that car that he was driving out here tonight and held the keys up and said, I'll give it to anybody that wants it. There's nobody that would drive his car out of here for it. It was awful. And he had tears streaming down his face and saying, Preacher, God gave me this. Man, I started crying. He started hitting. He thought I was happy. I was under conviction. He was hitting the dash. And when he'd hit the dash, dust would bull up out of that dash (laughs) from the dust down there. And I'd slap the dash and dust would bull and we was having a camp meeting in that car. I was so happy because I was with somebody that was so grateful. I got out on the sidewalk and I said, Brother, I want to do something. Can I pay your salary this week? Oh, no, Pastor. He said, I don't want you to do anything like that. I said, oh, but wait a minute. Man, it would be an honor. And I took a $20 bill out of my pocket and put it in his hand. You'd have thought I gave him a million dollars. He was so grateful. That little boy was so happy. And yet, you know what it was? He, he had never got over what God done for him. And yet, we're in a place and we live in a, a country where there's an abundance of everything. People's got everything. And yet the truth of it is we grumble and complain. Hey, don't lose what you got. Let me say this right here. Then never underestimate the power of the enemy. You know what Nabal did? He never under he underestimated David. He thought, well, I got servants down here. They come down here to take my sheep, they're gonna find out something. But wait a minute. Hey. He found out something all right. God was with David. And I want to tell you something. Folks, if you're not careful, you'll underestimate the power of the devil. Now you say, yeah, preacher, but 1 John 4, 4 said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I understand that. But I'll tell you, when you get relaxed as a church or as a Christian, you're getting ready to be preyed upon. Hey, why do you think Simon Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion seeketh whom he may devour. I'm so happy this church is doing well. It looks so nice. The spirit's so good here. The singing's wonderful. The, The fellowship's grand. But for one minute, you better not forget. You're still targeted. Satan's got his scope on you and on me. He's watching for the least little opportunity to spring in. So you can never drop your guard. You got to constantly walk guard around things. You got to constantly be watching. Be sober. 
Be vigilant. Yes, sir. You say, why? He comes in. And by the way, let me say this. He's dangerous as a roaring lion. But he's ten times more danger as an angel of light. People don't run from angels. They run from lions. But an angel is powerful. An angel of light may come in smiling. They may come in and want to join this church. And the devil use them. Now I'm not telling you to be leery of people. I'm not telling you to do that. But I am telling you better watch. You better be careful. I, I, I had a, a family here a few years ago started visiting our church. Sharp looking family started coming. And they were so nice. They were nice. They were, they were kind, nice and everything. But listen to this. When I started getting on one morning, man, I thought, they, I thought they was on board. And I got on that King James one morning. And I started talking about, I started talking about how much I was for it. And I noticed them burr up. And I noticed a difference in them. And I said to one of our men, they, they don't seem like they're quite the same. He said, well, preacher. He said, that man ain't carrying no King James. And he said, that, that woman's daddy is a pastor and he ain't, they're, they're, they're liberal. He said, he said, pastor, I want to tell you, he said, you got to watch. And you know what? They, what? they didn't hang around long, they left. But I'm telling you right now, you listen to what I'm telling you. You said, well, preacher, that don't mean they're lost. It don't mean they're lost, that means they're messed up. Right. I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to tell you right now. Brother, you better keep your eyes open. Amen. And by the way, keep teaching it and preaching it. I don't get up and get on that every time I preach, but I want to tell you something. I hit it often enough. If they're out in there, it, it keeps it pretty well. It's almost like I don't need a haircut every week, but I do like to get it trimmed up. And you've got to keep things trimmed down. To where they know often where you stand. Hey, let me just say this right here. Uh, never underestimate the power of the enemy. Now I'm going to give you something else. That's how you don't lose what you got. Can I tell you this? Never leave things unguarded. In verse 13, And David said unto his men, Gird ye every man on his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up... Uh, uh, after David, about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. It's probably about 600. But notice, David did not want to lose what he already had accumulated. Right. That's why he left behind 200. Right. Amen. Never leave what we've got unguarded. Amen. Don't leave that unguarded. Right. We'll take 400 troops with us, but we're going to leave 200 here to keep what we've already yeah. got. Amen. So never leave things unguarded. Hey, never leave the message unguarded. Amen. I'm talking about the message of the virgin birth Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, it ought to be hit. Yeah. Not just Christmas. Right. Right. Yep. Brother, people need to know that the Lord Jesus Christ, Brother Richardson, was born of a virgin. Amen. That His blood was vital. Amen. Amen. That His death and suffering was vicarious Come on. Come on. and that his resurrection was victorious yes. and that one day his return will be visible yes. and that his scriptures is verbally inspired yes. now I'm going to hit that stuff pretty regular you say why? I don't want to leave it unguarded I want a liberal if he comes in I want him to get real uncomfortable then let me say this right here. Never leave the message unguarded. Never leave the manual unguarded. Amen. You know, when we remodeled our church, I probably told this here. I've told everything I know here. <laughs> but when we remodeled our church, we put wood on the platform like this, and they said, Preacher, is there anything you want? And I said, Yes. I want a hole 
a, a metal box under the floor, right under the pulpit. I want it right where I stand. And I want a brand new King James Schofield Bible in that metal box. And I'm going to write a message in the front of it. And then I want to put some good leather conditioner on it and lay it in that box. And when we redo the other auditorium, they done the same thing over there. I want another one just like it over there. And then I want you to cover the floor and put that Bible in there. He said, but it'll be covered up. And I said, that's what I want. Because one of these days after I'm dead and gone and the devil's crowd takes over here and they take a crowbar and they tear these boards out of here to make a dance floor, they're going to find that book. And you know what I wrote in it? I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And then I wrote, God help you if you ever use any other Bible in this pulpit other than this one. And then I signed my name to it. And I want the devil's crowd to know when they found that, that a man of God that believed that book pastored that church. Don't mess with the manual. Don't mess with the message. And then let me say, don't mess with the meeting house. Don't mess with the church. This is God's bride. You don't mess with the church. Brother, let me tell you, your church here ought to keep it holy. And keep it to where, listen, the things, this church ought to be sanctified, set apart for the things of God. You know, nowadays we live, you hardly ever hear of people having weddings in churches anymore. They have them in barns and outbuildings and everything down our way. Now, I don't understand all that myself. You know, if I wanted God to get my home, I'd want to have it at the altar of the church. But you know, a lot of people don't want to go by the standards. They want to come in naked and get married showing everything they've got playing rock music and country music and everything else and they want to have a bunch of people standing around in that thing that don't even look like they've ever thought about God. Am I telling it right? Hey, don't mess with the meeting place. This is to be a holy place. And you say, well, you don't worship the place. No, but you keep the place where it's fit to worship. Are you following me? Yes, they ought not never, as long as you live, they ought not ever be a bunch of mop heads to get up here with a bunch of lights flashing and a bunch of smoke coming up and a bunch of rock and roll outfit up here. That ought not ever to happen. Don't you let that happen. Something ever happens to this man right here, you men that have been raised up in this church, if somebody comes in here and tries that, you tackle them. And you, you drag them out of here. You said that's not what this place is about. Brother, I'm tired of seeing churches that was built by people of God taking God's money and building, erected buildings and bought PA systems and pianos and organs and, and was and buses and, and worked on the place and then after something happened to the man of God, some little some little old uh, girly looking preacher comes in and takes that thing and turns it in and turns it in to nothing but a uh, nothing in but nothing where they have a bunch of blowouts in it that ain't got nothing to do with God. Let me tell you something. Hey, never leave the things unguarded. Amen. Then let me say, don't leave unguarded the music. Yes, you don't have to do one thing here. You don't have to do one thing. Just leave it where it's at. Amen. You don't have to change nothing. You don't have to improve. You got it. Just keep it where it is. And don't let somebody come in here and try to tell you, well, it needs to be this if you're going to get people. 
Well, let me tell you what it needs to do. It needs to please God and that's it. Then don't leave the mandate unguarded. Soul winning. Brother, let me tell you. People said, well, we got some new ways to reach people. Now, I'm not opposed to you finding something that'll work with your soul winning. But don't, miss, but don't trade in your soul winning. Amen. You know, I got a little mirror that I use sometimes. It's a book. And it says, uh, uh, what's it say on the front of it? Uh, 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 who did Jesus die for? And it's written in gold, a little hardback book. Now I'll take that thing sometimes when I'm out and I'll say, you ever read this book? And somebody will say, no, I don't believe I've ever seen it. I said, it don't take me a minute to read it. They said, I ain't got time. I said, yeah, you do this. And I'll just open it up. And when they do, they're just looking at a mirror. Why Jesus died, that's what it's called. When you open it up, they look, they're looking at their self. I said, that's why he died right there. And I was giving them a plan of salvation. Now, I'm not talking about don't find something like that not to use. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about saying we're going to do something else besides soul winning to get people in. You cannot improve on the Great Commission. You can't improve on the Great Commission. Let me just say this and I'll be done. Then never leave... Un, never leave unconsciousness of losing what you have because of getting busyness. You can get too busy to do anything for God. I mean, I've got people that sometimes say, Preacher, I, I do that, but I'll be honest with you, I'm just, I've got so busy. You remember the man over there in 1 Kings chapter 20 that was guarding a prisoner? He was guarding a prisoner, and they said, Now, you, you take care of that prisoner. You take care of him. Now if you lose him, it's like that Philippian jailer was, it's going to be your life for his. And when they come back to check on him, you read it. It's 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 40. And this is what the man said. The man escaped. They said, what happened? And this is what he said. I was busy here and there. And he lost his life over it. You know, if you're not careful, you will get so busy. You ain't got time for God. Well, you say, you know, I got to take this job and I got to do this and I got to do this. Let me tell you what you got to do. You'll make more serving God than you will getting out there trying to work three secular jobs to have more. You find something you can do and you get faithful at it. Amen. 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 Brother, let me tell you something. Don't start taking something to take you out of here on Sunday. Don't you take some job that will pull you out of this place on Sunday. And when you get off from work on Wednesday night, you may have to come in in your work clothes and sit down in here. But you, you do that before you, you quit. He'd rather have you here in a pair of work boots and your work shirt and work pants than he would to have you not here. You can get too busy. You can get too busy to do anything for God. Last thing, I'm done. Never leave the unconverted. Never leave the unconverted the way you found them. Remember that man in... Remember that old boy down in Luke 10 that fell among thieves going down to Jericho and the Levite saw him and got on the other side of the road just passed him by and the priest passed him by. Thank God for that Samaritan to come along though, picked him up and poured, bandaged him up and, and gave him something to eat and drink and took him and set him on his own beast and took him to the inn and said, and whatever else is owed, when I get back, I'll pay you. You know what he did? He didn't leave him the way he found him. Hey, let me tell you. Brother, what we need to do tonight is keep doing what we already know to do. You say, well, preacher, tonight, you hadn't told us one thing we didn't already know. 
You know what? You're absolutely right. Amen. But I reminded you yeah. of some things tonight yeah. that if you're not careful, right. you'd say, how in the world did we drop the ball on that? Amen. Walk guard around this place. Yeah. Some yeah. of you men at different hours, you come out here and walk around this place and pray a hedge around it. You ladies, you pray over this place. So, oh God, keep the devil off of it. Amen. You walk around it and pray over it. Yes. Ask God to do something here. Amen. And let me tell you something. In years and years and years to come, I believe you're going to see some of the greatest days you have ever seen coming down the road in this Amen. church. Amen. Don't fumble the ball here. Amen. Keep doing what you know to do. Naboth that died, he got drunk and went into a dunk, drunken stupor. I don't have time to read it all. Brother, he sat down and just killed himself drinking. Yeah. Sat down literally and died drunk. And you know what happened? David come back by after he was dead and saw that beautiful woman standing there. And he said, well, uh, Abigail, what you going to do now? She said, well, I haven't really given it a lot of thought. But uh, he said, well, how would you just like to just go with me and be the one? Be the wife of the king. I'm going to be the king one day. And brother, before it was over, preacher, David had the whole farm. He had Abigail. He had, the, he had it all. The sheep. Old Curlish Nabal would have been better off if he would have just cooperated. But he lost it all. Because of ungodliness and, unse and selfishness. Let's bow our heads. Now Father I've done the best I know how to do. And Lord. I pray that you'll use this message tonight. To help somebody to.